So um, we have had, I think, here uh, great perspectives of uh, different business leaders. Uh, I'd like to open up for questions. We'll take a few questions. So I think there are some mics coming up. Let me take yeah, just a second. We have one question here, one here, one here. I'll, I'll collect three questions and we'll go by batch of three. Yeah, please. Uh, good afternoon. Narendra Taneja from India. Uh, very interesting, good to hear perspective from Germany and Total, uh, which is probably more dynamic in terms of looking at the new world order than probably most of the governments in the Western part of the world in particular. Uh, you see, the, uh, my sense is the, the world order is already changing. For instance, the global gravity center, be economics or energy for that matter, other issues as well, has already moved to the region between let's say Israel and Japan and Australia, some call it Asia, some call it Indo-Pacific, I leave it to your choice. But it has already moved. But how many countries, for instance, in the OECD are actually willing to acknowledge it? They do sometime, but when you look at their policies and their obsessions, nothing is changing. It's 1.30 billion versus 6.7 billion. 1.30 billion is OECD population, and the rest of the world, that is 6.7. Yeah. You see, the point is that, you know, uh, these 1.3 billion, they are used to building global narratives, controlling them, disseminating, and they want the world order the way they want it. Yeah. But there are 6.7 billion people, and Asia has risen. There are countries like India, there are countries like China, there are countries now wait for some time, you know, Indonesia, and wait for some more time, Africa. So now the point is that how long, for instance, the OECD countries would go on just having meetings, conferences, and listen to themselves. Okay. Some people call it echo yeah. chamber. <laughs> World is changing. Yeah. Recognize it as soon as you can. My sense is Total has. Why don't you follow Total? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. I'll just take uh, two other questions. There was one here in front. Sorry. One here in the front. Lady in front. Uh, Laurent Cohen Tanujiam, an international lawyer and uh, <coughs> writer on geopolitics in Paris. Uh, the panel has so far addressed uh, how business can and should uh, adapt to geopolitics, but I'd, I'd like to reverse the perspective and have the panelists' views on, on how business can influence geopolitics, uh, to what extent it, it can, because geopolitics does not stand in a, in a vacuum, and I'm not only talking about influential business leaders who could influence uh, political leaders, but business as a whole uh, and civil society uh, have had a big influence on, on global challenges in, in recent years. And so as geopolitics is becoming a global challenge and has a negative impact on, on the economy and governments care about growth and employment and so on and so forth. So I think uh, we should start thinking more in a more organized way on how business can have a voice in the, in the evolution of geopolitics. Thank Great, you. thank you very much. I think there was a third question here, please. The lady in the front row, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to have uh, more details about what Madame says, said about the risk assessment and uh, um, where you get, you happen to have more risk in, in countries you don't expect uh, than in Africa. And uh, I think Total, Total Energy as a global company is a very, a very interesting source, so I would like to know more about that. And the second uh, question uh, linked to that is whether uh, the crisis of war in Ukraine has an impact on the risk assessment in Africa as we see now that, uh, you know, getting back to Africa to, to, have, to get more energy with uh, countries uh, uh, which used to be not so popular. So how does it look? What is the impact on that for, on Africa? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think there's a great set of, of, of questions. Um, one about the rise of Asia, uh, one around the possibility of business to influence geopolitics, and I think also the question about the relative risk assessment. So uh, given the last question, maybe Hele, may I ask you to pick up uh, on this topic uh, and, and answer like 
shortly. We have just a few minutes left uh, on, on the risk assessment potentially, or also potentially on uh, yeah. other questions. So uh, risk assessment, it's hard for me to summarize uh, in a few words, but um, we have a risk mapping exercise that we do in the, com in the company from bottom up. So every affiliate, business unit, side and so on has to do a risk assessment. Then we aggregate those, it's eff effectively a map, and we look at the occurrence, so the probability of likelihood, uh, the severity, and uh, we look at you know, how good would we be to mitigate. So three dimensions, and we, we make all these maps, then we aggregate them, and then we come up with a corporate map, and then at the executive committee level, we also do the map, and there is a methodology here which uh, is the same we do for compliance risk, which is we vote on the risks. And then we end up with a list of risks. And if you look at our universal registration document, you'll not get the map, but you will get the risks. Okay? And that's dynamic. So uh, the minimum frequency of, of updating this is three years. And we just finished, actually, this fall, an update uh, from what we did in uh, 2019. And then we, when we have all these risks, we look at are there clear owners or are there not owners. So in our company, a big risk would be, for instance, a major industrial accident, you know, an oil spill or whatever. So are there people whose daily lives is to handle that risk? Yes, they are within my organization also. But so we consider that the risk is being taken care of, so fine. And then we find risks that maybe are more subtle, uh, fall in between other risks, in between the cracks, if you want. And then we have a global risk committee um, that actually assigns a risk to someone or a team, and we deal with it. And then we do a lot of crisis preparation and so on and so forth. But so I think we have a framework, because of the industry we're in, because of its intrinsic characteristics, that we have been fine-tuning for years, actually. Okay. Great. And maybe just building on this, um, because the, the connected question was also about, let's say, the rise of uh, Africa, Middle East, Asia. So maybe a quick comment from you, Mr. Masrui, and then from Sam about, do you see that the political development over the last few years, accelerated by the war in Ukraine, has kind of changed the weight of these regions? Yes, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the world uh, are in race. Each country in, in the globe is trying really their best to be the, to create a good environment for, for an investment, to, to create a strong economy. And we've seen it all over the world. I mean, we are seeing now superpower like China and India is taking the lead in the uh, world uh, economy. They are becoming number one, number two, number three, replacing Europe and North America. If now, at least in the uh, future, unless Europe and America do something about it. In the Middle East here as well, despite the challenges we've seen, uh, we are trying our best. We faced a lot of challenges. Uh, my friend at the back here asked question whether the business can influence the geopolitical. I think, you know, we, I can give you an example. We've been attacked in the UAE by our neighbors, Iran, but not directly. They created what they call war by proxy. They go to Yemen, control the country, and from there they are attacking here by drones. They are also doing this, the same thing in the Middle East, in Lebanon. The, they are existing in Syria and Lebanon, threatening the neighboring countries. In addition to this, they also went to Europe and Ukraine. I'm sure you heard in the news. <coughs> their drones are supplied to the Russian with, 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 the, with their crew, where they are attacking a European country in the daylight. So business cannot really influence. What we are trying to do here in UAE, as an example, we are trying to provide our citizens and our residents the best life, best opportunities. We, have, we are accommodating 80% of the population is expatriate. And we are trying to provide for them the best living condition, the best security. And I'm sure if you 
if you go through in, into our s cities, you will find them secured, clean, and people are living in a, in a very good, good condition. This is our aim, and we are hoping to be one of the most successful country, if not in the world, but at least in our region, for the sake of uh, our resident and our people. Yeah, and we have the pleasure to enjoy it while we're here as well. So I think <laughs> Thank that's you. a great point. So maybe, Sam, because we're uh, running out of time, but I'd like to have your perspective on this regional shift and the role uh, Africa would be playing in the light of the geopolitical fragmentation, multi-alignment that also Maurice mentioned before. What would be your concluding remark here? Madam asked a very pertinent question, especially about the vulnerabilities uh, that the war in Ukraine, for example, has exposed in the systems uh, around the world, especially in, in, in developing countries. And I just gave the example of uh, Sri Lanka, for example, or the examples of what we have in, uh, in Africa. And it's very important that we start to understand the impact that global activities have on a local perspective, because the, the crisis in Ukraine has, you know, uh, triggered demonstrations in Sri Lanka as a result of, you know, food and uh, fuel uh, crisis that turned into a political problem. And I think African governments have started to learn from that really, really quickly. I think it was uh, uh, le président sénégalais, si je me rappelle bien, that, you know, went off immediately to Russia to try and go and, you know, negotiate the déblocage of, of uh, you know, wheat exports. And that, in one hand, you know, shows that, you know, there are real vulnerabilities that could turn from economic problems to political or security or instability problems. And on the other hand, starts to, you know, uh, give credence to the question from, uh, uh, from back there around the important role that businesses could play in influencing geopolitics. And I think this is where these kinds of roles that we're talking about, like a chief trade officer becomes, you know, very important. And when you find corporate society and corporate organizations from an organized perspective being able to present a front to political leadership, that starts to influence policy and that starts to make governments you know, pay real attention. I think those are two very important, uh, important questions that, uh, that we should not ignore at all. Thank you, Sam. Uh, merci beaucoup à ce panel uh, tout à fait extraordinaire qui nous a donné la possibilité d'avoir une perspective business sur le monde en complément des perspectives politiques, institutionnelles et religieuses que nous avions eues ce matin. Et donc, euh, au plaisir de continuer cette discussion en offline. Merci d'avoir été aujourd'hui avec moi euh, et à bientôt. Merci. Merci. Merci.